the website Ashley Madison gives married people who want to cheat on their spouses the ability to just point and click their way to an extramarital affair. You say this is just an honest site and it's doing the country a service. Absolutely. Some reality TV stars are getting dragged into this cheating website scandal. This hack has a lot of people sweating it out right now. We mentioned it earlier. More information and it links federal, state, even foreign government web addresses to the site called Ashley Madison. These people do love and cherish their family relationships. They care about their partner. They love their kids, their economic situation, but they're absent intimacy. And anyone in that situation, it's like not having enough oxygen or not having enough water to drink. They're going to need to change that. And so they come on our service. When you watch I feel terrible. This I, I genuinely. How do you I genuinely... feel to be coming and kicking your ass right now? How would you like that? That's how I feel right now. This is the tale of Ashley Madison. And no, I don't mean that favourite stripper of yours that you visit on the weekend. I'm talking about the dating sites, alive and kicking for almost a quarter of a century and designed to facilitate extramarital affairs. It's about as dystopian as it gets, isn't it? I mean, it even comes with a tagline so absurdly blunt that it sounds like a parody. It sounds like something from a billboard in Cyberpunk or a radio ad in GTA 5. An online dating platform cultivated for affairs sounds like enough on its own, and you'd be right. But then there's its CAO and parent company who obsessively stirred up more drama and controversy. There's the questionable, even dishonest way in which the site was run in the first place. And then, of course, there was the fact that Ashley Madison was hacked in 2015. The hack in of in itself is an interesting and ludicrous event, making this already weird timeline of an adulterous dating platform even stranger still. But the hack as well, it gives us a very good look into the shady inner workings and secrets of the Ashley Madison site, a lot of which probably were never meant to reach the light of day. Come with me, if you will, and I'll do my best to take you through this weird and wacky little tale. From obscure beginnings to controversial controversial heights to a worldwide scandal. This is the Ashley Madison Affair. <laughs> Ashley Madison was created on January 21st, 2002 by Darren J. Morganston. He apparently came up with the name by combining the then two most popular names for girls in the USA. And there was me thinking they just went with the most stripper sounding name they could come up with. Morganston is by all accounts a die-hard entrepreneur, starting his first gig at around only 14 years old. He'd continue then with several different kinds of ventures in things like telecoms and real estates before eventually settling his beady eyes upon the World Wide Web in the early 2000s. Back then, the internet was a very different place. It was clunkier, somewhat untested, certainly slower, and pretty unregulated as well. A bit of a wild west compared to what it is today. Social media sites and chat rooms were brand new and very exciting things, and the idea of making one just for dating had already been seized on. One of the oldest and most notable examples of a dating site is Match.com, which started all the way back in 1995 and was followed pretty swiftly by several copycats. So, Making just another dating site, that wasn't enough on its own by the time we trundle into the 2000s. You had to find a niche in the market by this point in time. Something that would put you aside from all your competitors and give you an edge in the market. And yes, you guessed right, this is where the fucking affairs come into the picture. Morganston had read an article about another dating site called Lava Life. And this article stated that the third of the site's users were married. The emergence of these sites gave people a brand new, a completely different level of anonymity. Maybe even more so back in those early days of cyber security. You could, just as you still can now, make a fake profile with a load of fake details and go and live out your weird, adulterous fantasies to your heart's content. And providing you remember to delete your fucking browser history, you'll never get caught. So, seeing as so many people were apparently already doing this anyway, Morganston decided to capitalise on it. That was basically his main defence when asked questions such as, Hey dude, why in the name of God did you make this fucking monstrosity? And essentially, it's still the go-to justification for the site's existence today. Oh, people are always going to cheat, we're just providing them with a safe and secure place in which they can do so. It's a politician answer 101. It's fucking watertight, baby. Over the next five years, the Ashley Madison site would grow pretty consistently attaining over 1.5 million sign-ups by the end of 2007. By now though, dear old Darren Morganston was starting to get a little bit restless. 
Die-hard entrepreneur, remember? He wasn't one for managing day-to-day -day operations, more setting up new ventures. And so, in 2007, he sold the website to a company called Avid Life Media. Its founder and CAO, Noel Biederman, would take to this adulterous website like a duck to water. He had a few other raunchy dating sites under Avid Life Media too, one for cougars, and one most notably called Established Men, which was basically, and this is the nicest way I can put it, a dating site for pimps and sugar daddies. But Biederman seemingly wanted to make our favourite website for cheaters a fine addition to his collection. At the end of 2007, Ashley Madison would get itself a sexy new rebrand and marketing campaign to herald its new CAO's appointment. At around this point in time, its most famous slogan ever, life is short, have an affair, would first appear. Several celebrities, politicians, and other high-profile figures that had been exposed for cheating in the past would suddenly start appearing on Ashley Madison ads and billboards too. I want to just show a couple of the ads too that you have because they are somewhat political. This is one that features uh, Newt Gingrich. It says, unfaithful husband, Welcome to Ashley Madison. Can you see that? Yeah. Ashley Madison is a huge pile of controversy, as it is anyway. As the site's CAO, the fact that it even exists is going to get you, shall we say, some interesting and varied responses from the general public. Biederman, though, seemed to revel and be well at home in amongst all this contention and controversy. That's clear enough alone from some of his ads, or from his failed bid to rename the Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix, Arizona, after Ashley Madison. He wasn't afraid to go on interviews or talk shows either, and would eagerly debate with news anchors or critics and play the devil's advocate. Noel Biederman was a very talented shit-stirrer, basically. He essentially played the same fiddle as his predecessor, Darren Morganston. We're not encouraging cheating, guys. We're just providing a safe space that's free of judgment for all those people that are already gonna do it. So there's a lot of shooting the messenger, but we're just you know, fulfilling a void that exists in the marketplace. But does it bother you on a moral level? It does not. Level? You can't convince anyone to have an affair. You just can't. I don't have that power of persuasion. However, he was able to do it in a much more effective way. Biederman brought to the table and to his interviews this kind of righteous indignation about the questionable sites. And it's a blend of fascinating and infuriating. He even attended a couple of interviews with his wife and insisted that their relationship was closed healthy and all tickety-boo. Because you are traditionalists, traditionalist, like you said, if uh, your husband was cheating on you, would you be okay with him going to a site such as yours with him saying, I think it will help the marriage? Absolutely not. That's not what I signed up for. That's not what you we- You practice what you preach. And then just to top this off, Biderman stuck his wife on a fucking billboard ad for Ashley Madison as well. Chill out, please, you little gremlin of chaos. But this is essentially the cycle of growth that Ashley Madison fell into. Controversial stunts and ads, followed by shock and outrage in the media, a couple of interviews to clarify things, and then maybe even an ad or two being pulled. Online dating was still a new and interesting and novel idea in the early 2000s, so it was getting a healthy dose of attention from news outlets and media anyway, but one solely catering to people wanting affairs is going to attract a different kind of chat on the 6 o'clock news. But what Biedenman understood was that this kind of moral outrage about his site, it wouldn't really damage it all too much, not to an extent, anyway. The argument that the site was only facilitating affairs, not encouraging them, that was still pretty solid and deflected most news anchor questions, the generic ones anyway. But as well, anyone genuinely considering an affair or cheating on their partner, they're probably not going to give a fuck about a crude ad or the fact that that ad's been taken down or a load of news articles or news companies or fucking shows denouncing the site as evil. If anything, that's just going to intrigue these kinds of people. And so, by the start of the 2010s, Ashley Madison had somewhere around 7 to 10 million users and was still growing rapidly and consistently. It had become the ultimate elephant in the room. It was debated on daytime, it was poked at on nighttime TV, and it had developed a look and an ad campaign that was so well known it had basically burnt into the back of everybody's mind. You only had to see that famous slogan or that fucking woman with her finger across her lips and you knew exactly what you were dealing with and what was being discussed. 
The way Ashley Madison functions is not too dissimilar from a casino. You must buy either digital chips or a monthly subscription in order to do pretty much fucking anything at all, to be honest with you. I'm not just talking things like profile boosts and sending super likes that you see on dating sites these days. I'm talking things like video calls, sending, and even receiving your texts are locked behind a paywall. Unless you are constantly feeding this hungry little bastard of a website money, it will just stop working and will not function even on a basic level. Even leaving this website can potentially cost you money, with Ashley Madison offering to wipe your profile and all its data for the measly price of $20. I know what you might be thinking, who in their right mind would put up with this? I mean, this is just practically theft. It's so blatantly extortionate, it might as well just smack you across the face. Ashley Madison's offer to purge all your incriminating evidence helps to explain, perhaps obviously, why people will put up with these blatantly extortionate models. The users needed anonymity. In fact, they relied on it. If they are outed or exposed in any way, they're screwed. The game's not just up, so is potentially their entire lives. So if you can guarantee that something is risk-free, and completely anonymous, then suckers will inevitably cough up as much as you demand. But as well though, even if you are really pissed off about the extortionate way in which you have to pay to look at your text, I mean, what the fuck are you gonna do about it? The second you open your mouth to complain about your, your gripe and your problem, you're just immediately outed as having an affair. I mean, like, you can't do anything. It's the perfect model. Now, here is where the funny little twist comes in. All that shit I just mentioned about paying for your texts and your basic functions, it only applies if you're a man. If you're a woman though, you can do absolutely all of that shit completely for free. Why? Well, because women are essentially the items of value on this website. Most of the users on this platform were certainly male during the 2000s and early 2010s anyway, and it could still well be the case today to be honest, it wouldn't surprise me. The site was clearly set up to shake as many coins out of blokes as possible anyway, and yet Noel Biederman would always insist in his interviews and in statements that the site was predominantly geared towards women, in all ways from advertising to even the colour and text used on the site's login page. It's unclear why he'd say that. This. Maybe it was just a way to spark more hope in the desperate men on this website. Maybe it was just a way to spark more discussion and troll news anchors. Who knows? But it's clear from just the structure of this site that it's not only reliant on, but very much geared towards men as the predominant users, as attracting them as the main customers. And this would only get even more staggeringly obvious too. But we'll get back to that a little bit later. For now though, suffice to say, Avid Life Media was making an absolute fucking killing out of Ashley Madison. Which only meant they could funnel even more money into bigger, more eye-catching, more controversial ads and stunts for their site. Noel Biederman would then be wheeled out onto an interview panel and stir up even more drama with his self-righteous answers. The cycle of shit-stirring continued, the antics steadily increased, and Ashley Madison only climbed higher and higher. Biederman seemed to wholeheartedly believe that old saying that any publicity is good publicity. And by the way, that's complete bullshit. That idea is psychopathic. As I mentioned earlier, owing to the nature of the Ashley Madison site, it is essentially immune from some kinds of negative backlash, mainly moral outrage and concerns about whether it's prim and proper enough. So if you're clever and a teeny bit ruthless, you can capitalise on that with minimal ramifications. But once you start to push the boat out with raunchy ads, ridiculous stunts and shit-stirring interviews, you'll start to get some other kinds of negative backlash. Some kinds you might not be so immune to. Biederman's strategy for his interviews is very good for generating heated discussion, but the drawback is you can also come off as quite arrogant, self-righteous, and full of yourself too. So I'm not going to convince anybody to have an affair. That's a decision you come to based on your life circumstances. What I'm saying is, if you've already decided to have an affair, if that's the road you're going down, don't do it in the workplace, and sure as heck, don't go on a single dating site and lie about your status. You can use my service and then at least self-publish, here's who I am and here's what I want, and you'll, you'll find a level of success. He never seemed to rise to the bait, almost like he doesn't care, like he knows he's gonna get away with it. It's fucking insufferable, isn't it? I, I, I get your right to have this website and be out there. What I don't get is why you bother to be pious about it. Owning a site that makes you extortionate amounts of money from infidelity 
is one thing. But publicly reveling in it, in interviews and with wacky stunts, is a completely different kettle of fish, my friend. This kind of behaviour, especially with the existence of the internet, is always, inevitably, going to piss someone off. Someone that's a bit more extreme, shall we say, than the average guy. Someone with a short fuse, or a strong moral conviction, who doesn't mind taking things into their own hands. As 2014 drew to a close, Noel Biederman and Avid Life Media had much to pat themselves on the back for. Ashley Madison could boast some 37 to 40 million members across the globe, and was projected to net about $150 million in revenue going into 2015. So the money train didn't stop rolling. In fact, if anything, it just sped up. And Noel Biederman continued on with his ballsy tactics without a care in the world. That is, until July the 12th, 2015. This is the day when the anonymous hacking group known as The Impact Team sent Avid Life Media this rather sobering message, accompanied to the theme of ACDC's Thunderstruck. We have taken over all the systems in your entire office and production domains. All customer information, databases, source code repositories, financial records, emails. Shutting down Ashley Madison and established men will cost you, but non-compliance will cost you more. We will release all customer records, profiles with customers, secret sexual fantasies, nude pictures, conversations, real names and addresses, and employee documents and emails. Avid Life Media will be liable for fraud and extreme harm to millions of of users. At first, it appears that Avid Life Media didn't take this threat very seriously. And to be fair, getting a threat, you know, I'm gonna hack your account, it's probably the emptiest threat on the internet. I'm pretty sure we've all experienced that at some point or another on Xbox Live. In this case though, the hack was actually genuine. And Noel Biederman didn't notice its severity until it was far too late. After a week of no response from Avid Life Media, the Impact team released their warning for a second time on July the 19th. This time, they put it on a public website, Pacebin, and added a 30-day countdown for Avid Life Media to adhere to demands before everything was released. It didn't take long before the story was picked up in the media, and by the following day, July the 20th, Avid Life Media had confirmed the threat as legitimate and gotten the officials involved. So, in a third statement on July 22nd, made clear to be their final warning, the Impact team released about 40 megabytes of information, which contained the names and account details of two random Ashley Madison users. Along with this, it expanded on their demands and what they intended to achieve, before signing off by directly addressing the top dogs of Avid Life Media. Well, Noel, Trevor, Liz one, what's it going to be? For the next 27 days, the investigations continued. The headlines kept churning out, and Avid Life Media kept calling upon more law enforcement, investigators, and cybersecurity experts in a desperate attempt to dig themselves out of this hole. The hole that Impact Team and many others would argue Avid Life Media had dug for themselves. Whatever efforts went on behind the scenes during this month period, we'll probably never know about. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter anyway, because all of them clearly didn't fucking go anywhere. Another thing that you can be certain on is based on everything that we've seen and heard about Noel Biederman, you can be confident that the idea of actually shutting down Ashley Madison, actually doing what the hackers say, that wouldn't even cross his mind as an idea. It just wouldn't. It wouldn't even register to him to actually shut down his two greatest cash cows. That just wouldn't be a viable option. So with the 30 days run dry, on the 18th of August 2015, the Impact team held true to its word and released approximately 10 gigabytes of Ashley Madison's user data in a torrent file on the dark web. Along with this ominous little message too. The first data dump consisted mainly of things like users' personal data, including things like their email addresses. And yes, you're right, I did say first data dump just then, because the following day, the Impact team would release another 20 gigabytes onto the dark web. In amongst this 20 gigabytes, a colossal 13 gigabyte file containing all of Noel Biederman's emails was sadly found to be corrupted. So, not wanting to seem like bad sports, the Impact team within 24 hours, replaced it with a 19 gigabyte file that contained 
all of Noel Biederman's email data. By this point in time, shit really starts to get a bit crazy, with Avid Life Media even issuing a $500,000 bounty for any information about these hackers. But that, and all the efforts of various investigators and law enforcement, were all totally fruitless anyway. The data dumps continued rolling out over the course of August, with Impact Team eventually claiming in an anonymous interview that they'd collected some 300 gigabytes of Ashley Madison data. When asked in the same interview about how much security Avid Life Media had, this was Impact Team's answer. Bad. Nobody was watching, no security. Only thing was segmented network. You could use pass 1234 from the internet to VPN to root on all servers. So not only is this site questionable in its morals and unfair in its mechanics, but it's also completely unsafe. Your safety's actually not given a shit about. And that does pretty much sum it up for Avid Life Media's operations of Ashley Madison. It was only really focused on profit, of getting as much money as humanly possible. The safety of users and their data, the security of the sites, even the actual features of the websites, all of it was rushed, neglected, or non-existent. All in order to focus on getting more money. But as the hacks would only further demonstrate as time went on, the appalling lack of cyber security was only the tip of the iceberg. All of the dirty tactics and schemes of Ashley Madison were now being laid out in public for everybody to see. But so too in the process were the personal details of millions of people. And with that came an avalanche of consequences. As Ashley Madison's data continued to be dumped onto the internet, the shock that surrounded these events began to transform into curiosity. Throughout the remainder of August 2015 and onwards, the hack was just a top story constantly in the media. But discussions over time slowly changed from outrage and shock over how this could happen, it turned into what was actually within all that data that was suddenly floating around on the web. Sure, not everybody knows how to access the dark web and torrented information, but it wouldn't take long before this information got just more accessible anyway. Before long, the everyman of the internet could get their hands on it. One of the most astonishing but telling revelations was the number of bot accounts on the website. It appeared that Ashley Madison had been setting up countless fake female profiles nicknamed as angels in company emails. Remember again, men on this site have to pay to talk to the women. That's how the system works. So according to the hack, about 31 million profiles are men and only about five and a half million profiles are female. So much for Noel Biederman's claims that women are the target audience and users of the site. But when you actually have a closer look at that five and a half million figure, it somehow gets astronomically worse. Of those 5.5 million female accounts, only about 1,400 of them ever opened their messages or their replies or even engaged with their accounts. 1,400. The rest of them were basically just immediately abandoned after they were created. This is pretty telling for the number of actual women that were on this site at this time, and in spite of Avid Life Media's attempt to defend themselves, it just made the extortionate pay-to-text system even more alarming, if not criminal. In those first days and weeks of the dumps though, Ashley Madison's fembot count was sidelined a little bit. The most pressing issue at this point in time was who the fuck was on the website. In less than 48 hours after the first file of data was released, search websites began to appear, designed to check the Ashley Madison data for things like names and email addresses. And with that, Pandora's box was truly open. Soon enough, the hunts were on, with people either out of curiosity or conviction searching up spouses, partners, celebrities, family, friends. In less than a week from the first data dump, radio shows were already inviting people to call in and check if their significant others were cheating live on air. You've got his details I've there. Got his, we've got his details here, um, and we yep. put them into the... I feel like we're on Jerry Springer, man. I feel like we, because uh, yeah. this is weird, because we're, we're putting him into this website right now, um, and his details have revealed, put it in, that he's actually on the website, Joe. Are you, are you, are you serious? Yeah, I'm sorry. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah, no, no, we, yeah. <laughs> These websites are disgusting, and that girl that called before, she should be ashamed of herself. Yeah. Oh, Joe's gone. 
Oh, I don't know if I should have done that. That hasn't left me with a good feeling. Marriages and relationships ended. Families were torn apart. Many people fell victim to things like scams and numerous cases of fraud and identity theft all started appearing all within the first week of that first data dump. Perhaps the biggest metaphorical middle finger, though, was reserved for the users who had paid the $20 fee to eradicate their Ashley Madison account. Because surprise, surprise, shock of the century, the function didn't work. The payment details used to pay for the profile's deletion were still stored on the Ashley Madison's servers. Just take a couple of seconds to think about that. Even though your entire account and all your raunchy messages and all history that you'd ever been there had all been wiped, the proof that you'd needed a full deletion still existed. <laughs> and in a monumental feat of blind stupidity, the system completely defeats itself. Imagine hearing about the hack, thinking that you're okay because of the full delete, then realising that you're not okay, and then finally learning just as a kick in the face to boot that basically all the women you spoke to were fembots anyway and you never stood a chance. And all this, by the way, as funny as it sounds, would make Avid Life Media very, very liable for fraud. Plenty of public figures, politicians and celebrities were also found and outed during this leak. Perhaps one of the most notable being Hunter Biden. Yes, that Hunter Biden, son of the guy that's just about clinging on to the US presidency and his mental capabilities. I mean, Hunter Biden, he's not fucking dodgy at all, is he, guys? I mean, him? With an Ashley Madison account? <laughs> this sounds absurd. Other famous faces included reality TV star Josh Duggar, best known for his appearance in the hit show 19 Kids and Counting, which actually got cancelled following this shocking news. Duggar is, shall we say, quite right-wing, traditional and Christian about his views on marriage and the family, which just makes this shit even more ironic, doesn't it? And let me tell you, right here in Arkansas, we the people have spoken and we have said we support marriage. Why are guys like this always getting caught and outed in stupid ways for cheating? I mean, seriously, it's becoming a stereotype at this point. But perhaps the most notable name in amongst all that data was that of Noel Biederman himself. A series of his email chains suggested that he hooked up and had several affairs, one of which at least was long term. All of those interviews insisting that his marriage was totally healthy and rock solid, it was all just bullshit, just another tactic deployed in his shit-stirring crusade. But this little lie was just the beginning of Biederman's troubles. Not even the god-tier politician answers and deflecting that he unleashed in interviews could save him from this great big fuck-up. They say that a captain must always go down with the ship, but in this case, the captain was going down no matter whether the ship survived or not. <laughs> At the end of their great hacking stunt, the Impact team had every right to feel pretty good about themselves. For starts, so far they've still gotten away with it completely scot-free, with every single investigation and lead leading absolutely nowhere in the end. Even the top suspect, the man that Biederman was convinced was behind it all, came up as conclusively out of the picture. William Brewster Harrison was an ex-SEO expert. He'd worked for Ashley Madison in the past and had had access to their systems. He'd had a falling out with Biederman, had sent him some threat-filled emails, and had a history of cyber-attacking and stalking his ex-employers. Thinking of himself as some kind of vigilante on capitalism, based on the posts and rap lyrics he's written. He'd orchestrate some attacks on Biederman in around 2011-2012, including, in amongst other hilarious pranks, getting neo-Nazi sites to appear when you Google searched Biederman's name. And Biederman, just in case you weren't aware, is Jewish. So William Harrison seemed like the perfect fit for this hacking stunt, didn't he? But when his mother was located and asked for comment, she revealed that Harrison had committed suicide some 16 months before Impact Team had even made their first announcement. It was also discovered, interestingly, that Harrison was also Jewish as well, which meant that his neo-Nazi website practical joke, it wasn't down to racism as some suspected, it was just pure dedicated trolling. Who was the impact team? Was it one person or several? Was William Brewster Harrison involved prior to his death? We'll probably never know the answers. That $500,000 bounty though is still up for grabs if you're interested. The effectiveness of the hack is a little bit up for debate. I mean, Impact Team's original statement and demand was that Ashley Madison and effective men should shut down. 
and they're still both up and running to this day. However, the Impact team did have a lot of, for want of better words, impact in other ways. For a start, it's all a lot quieter and much less cocky now. Avid Life Media would quickly and quietly rebrand into Ruby Life in 2016, most likely in an attempt to distance themselves from the carnage of the hack and the questionable practices of the company beforehand. Ashley Madison's ads and social stunts have all but simmered away by this point. Ashley Madison even abandoned its famous life is short catchphrase for a while, adopting this almost PG look for a little bit in 2016 while tensions died down. But even once the old slogan and branding reappeared, the site still remained very quiet and out of the public eye, as best as it could. And Established Men is barely even advertised at all. It's only mentioned like once on their website, quietly in a little paragraph in the corner. Unlike Ruby Life's other two great big domains, which are slapped on the front page of their website. I mean, Established Men, it only seems to exist on Google Play. I couldn't even find it on the App Store. <laughs> Basically, Ashley Madison and Avid Life Media, they weren't killed, but they were very much reminded of where they stand. They've stopped feeling all tough and invincible, like they can get away with anything, and they now sit quietly in a corner, doing their best to keep out of the public eye and out of public scrutiny. A name change and rebranding wouldn't protect old Ruby life, though, from the shitload of lawsuits that it was smacked across the face with. One pretty hefty example came only a week after the data dumps began, filed by two Canadian law firms on behalf of all Canadian citizens. In case you weren't aware, Ashley Madison is predominantly based in Canada. Anyway, the lawsuit was for somewhere around 570 million Canadian dollars, and it's been varyingly successful, owing to the fact that in order to get any compensation, you have to come up and expose yourself as a cheater for a second time in front of a court of law. Ruby Life, Avid Life, whatever you want to call them, they have been hit with multiple different lawsuits suits and are still in the process of contesting some and paying others out to this day. So that just leaves us with the fate of old Noel Biederman, arguably the Impact Team's main target in all of this. No surprises here, but he didn't last long as the CAO of Avid Life Media. He announced he was stepping down just eight days after the first data dump, with a statement from the company stating that it was in everybody's best interests that he does so. That, of course, is business jargon, and if we translate it into plain English, Noel was basically told to get the fuck out pronto. While the company went about damage control and rebranding, Noel slunk off into the shadows, going incognito for quite a while. Eventually, a LinkedIn page for Biederman reappeared, stating that he now ran a small software company in Toronto that helps other companies with their data collection. Most amazingly of all, his fucking wife is still with him after all of this and has stuck by his side throughout the entire hack and ensuing media storm. Maybe she's mental. Maybe she was just as invested in the Ashley Madison gig as her husband. Who knows? Noel Biederman doesn't seem to be doing too badly then, does he? But do remember that he has at least been publicly shamed and disgraced, and he's probably going to have to spend the rest of his life being pretty quiet and quite discreet. And for a man who seemed to adore being the centre of attention, the main source of Ashley Madison's chaos in its formative years. For that kind of man, having to go unnoticed seems like quite a fitting little punishment. So then, ladies and gentlemen, there we have it, the end of another video. Thank you very much for tuning in to The Mooncake Show. I hope you've enjoyed. If you're new around here and like this kind of content, I'm pleased to say that I now have a nice little back catalogue of other mockumentaries you can watch. Videos that, you know, talk about similar topics and give off a similar vibe to this. So if that's your kind of shit, there'll be a playlist at the end of this video. If you fancy hearing more from me, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, obviously. You'll know when I upload, but I also post quite a lot in that community tab, so you can see that shit there. But I've also got a Twitter as well, where I just put a load of degenerate memes and shit like that, to be honest. So if you fancy hearing more of my stupid opinions, you can go follow that as well, it'll be in the description. Any likes, shares and stuff like that you can afford is also tremendously appreciated and helps out a hell of a lot, so thank you for that. The channel is doing staggeringly well at the moment, to be honest. It's a little bit kind of like, pinch me, am I awake? But thank you very much, I am honestly blown away and, and really, really humbled. Please keep it coming. Anyway, that'll about do it from me. Thanks again for watching, take it steady, remember to look both ways when you cross the road. And I'll leave you with this passing thought. Do you know why the duck crossed the road? It was the chicken's day off.